What's up everybody, it's La Marte Blanca and we are back with another Explained video. Some time ago, Atlas announced it's finally adding more Persona games to platforms outside of PlayStation. And as a PC main, I can't wait. To celebrate this, we're explaining one of my favorite RPGs of all time, Persona 4 Golden, the enhanced version of Persona 4. Between the life sim, events, side content, social links, character arcs, combat, and fusions, there is so much to this game that any recap including this one cannot truly do it justice. But I will do my best as we focus on the main storyline, including every single ending. This game is amazing and I cannot recommend it enough. However, if you are one of those that can't spare 70 plus hours to experience this masterpiece for yourself, don't worry, I got you. So you magically show up in this fancy limo with a dude who looks like the unfortunate result of Ebenezer Scrooge fucking a vulture, and his assistant Vanna White. Pinocchio's name is really Igor, and he calls this place the Velvet Room. It exists between dream and reality. His assistant is Margaret. He gives you a tarot card reading saying you're going to encounter misfortune and mystery. If mystery isn't solved, your future may be lost forever. No pressure. Your character, whose canon name is you, like why you, don't worry, this won't get confusing at all, is on a train to Inaba, Japan's version of bumfuck nowhere. Yu's parents are overseas on business, so he's staying with his uncle for a year. Yu arrives in Inaba, meets his uncle Dojima, a police detective, and his innocent little cousin Nanako. They stop for gas, Yu has an awkward conversation with the gas attendant, and starts feeling unwell. Because of this, they go home, and while they're home, the news is discussing a recent scandal involving a politician named Namatame who allegedly cheated on his singer wife with news reporter Mayumi Yamano. The next day is Yu's first day of school. He's in Moraoka's homeroom class, a total asshole who desperately needs to see an orthodontist. Later that day, the school makes an announcement about a serious incident that just happened and the students need to head home. Yu ends up meeting Chie, a short-haired girl obsessed with kung fu movies, and Yukiko, the girl in the red. Her family runs the inn Mayumi is allegedly staying at. As they leave school, a creepy kid from another school makes a play at Yukiko, who completely gets blown off. That night, the news reports a dead body hanging from an antenna, the body of Mayumi Yamano. Damn, we hit Igor's misfortune already? The next day, you finally meets Yosuke, the homie who ends up being your number two throughout the course of the game. He also has a crush on this girl named Saki, who he miserably strikes out with. She tells you about the Midnight Channel. You're supposed to look into a switched off TV at midnight on a rainy night, and you'll see your soulmate. That night on the news, there's an interview with a student who found Mayumi's body. The face is blurred, but obviously you can tell it's Saki. It's raining, so Yu attempts to watch the Midnight Channel, and a girl appears. So he does the logical thing and attempts to touch the TV. Then his arm just goes straight through it. What? The next day at school, Chie and Yosuke confirm seeing the same girl but don't know what to make of it. They go to Juness, basically this game's version of Walmart, and Yu does the magic arm thing again. The others panic and manage to knock themselves inside the TV to some foggy yellow mystery world. They run into a weird ass bear thing in PJs, can't make this up. Bear guy says someone's been throwing people into his world and they need to leave, so he magically conjures some TVs and pushes them back through. That night, a heavy fog rolls in, and the next morning, oh my god, another body is hanging from a telephone pole? It's Saki's? What the hell is going on? Yosuke rolls up with a theory, claiming people who show up on the Midnight Channel end up dead. Saki was on it recently, and he heard another student say that Mayumi was on it before her death. Not to mention the bear said someone's been throwing people in there. Hell bent on figuring out what happened to Saki, Yosuke rushes back into the TV. They find the bear again who explains the fog lifts in his world when it's foggy in the human world. That's when the quote unquote shadows get violent. Yosuke has no clue what he's saying, gets impatient, and straight up rips this dude's head off, fatality style. But unfortunately, bear doesn't die. He's hollow. He puts his head back on and continues to talk. Bear just wants to live peacefully and asks you to find the culprit. You remember Igor talking about a mystery, so you agree to take on the case. Bear's all happy, introduces himself as the most creative name you could possibly think of for a bear, Teddy. Yeah, I know. And pulls two sets of glasses out of his ass to help the human see through the fog in his world. Teddy takes them to a weird area that looks like Inuma's shopping district, saying places have been randomly popping up in his world. Then right before getting completely messed up by shadows, you pulls a card out of nowhere Gambit style, uses his only voice line in the entire game, Persona, goes Super Saiyan, and summons this badass that just finished his Bleach anime audition. Yu defeats the shadows, and they continue to investigate only to find Bizarro Yosuke. This new Yosuke starts spouting a bunch of dark thoughts, claiming it's how real Yosuke thinks because he is him. Him is he? 
I, I don't know. Glowing Yosuke is real Yosuke's shadow, his dark side, or otherwise known as the quote unquote true self. Real Yosuke denies it, saying it can't be him. This denial makes the shadow go berserk and turns into a big ass monster thing that you needs to beat up. So he does. And through this ass kicking, Yosuke accepts himself for who he is. This acceptance turns his shadow into a persona, and you just got his first party member. Yosuke realizes that Saki was likely killed by her other self, and Teddy explains that shadows are originally born from humans. They go berserk when the fog in the shadow world lifts. They learn they can save people while investigating the real culprit, so you can probably sense that the gameplay loop that's about to happen. Yukiko is interviewed on the news because of her in. Midnight Channel comes on later and it's Yukiko, but she's acting completely different from her normal self. Is that her shadow? The next day, Adachi, Dojima's partner who recently got transferred to Inaba, spills that Yukiko recently went missing. You'll soon learn that Adachi is a shitty cop who just talks way too much. Yukiko was likely thrown into the TV and they need to save her before the fog rolls in. Yu's first taken back to the Velvet Room though, where he finally learns how Igor and Margaret are going to help. You also meet Marie, a moody mysterious girl who has a very interesting character arc that we'll learn about more later. In the shadow world, you find the big ass castle Yukiko created. Things that humans suppress in their minds are actually taking form in the shadow world. Like an idiot, Chie rushes in. Yu finally catches up to her and she's having a teenage crisis about her inadequacy and her superiority complex over Yukiko. Naturally, she exclaims the shadow isn't her and you can guess what happens next. Just never thought the shadow monster of a teenage girl would end up being a dominatrix. Yu beats up this dominatrix, Chie faces her true self and gets a badass twin blade persona. They finally find Yukiko whose shadow is looking for someone to take her away from the burden of responsibility. She wants to live her own life. As you would guess, Yukiko denies these feelings and the shadow becomes a caged bird thing. If you haven't noticed already, it's really cool how the shadows are all representing the character's EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! Yu beats up Demon Tweety, Yukiko accepts her feelings, and gets a cool phoenix persona. Unfortunately, Yukiko doesn't remember anything about her kidnapping, which is also confirmed by Adachi before Dojima beats his ass for talking too much. Many days later, another nightly news broadcast shows Kanji Tatsumi, a hard ass that beats up biker gangs because they make too much noise and his mom can't sleep. Coincidentally, or not, the Midnight Channel shows someone who looks very similar to Kanji. The group heads to warn him about the kidnappings, they find him talking to a mysterious boy, and end up getting chased away by Kanji himself. Subtle. Another instance of the Midnight Channel shows Kanji clearly, meaning he's already been kidnapped and thrown into the TV. Group has to go in and save his ass. They fight through a bathhouse to find a super gay, super scandalous shadow that is emulating Kanji's fear of being rejected. All he really wants is to be accepted for who he really is. Guess what happens next? Really? I bet you won't. Kanji denies his shadow, it becomes a monster showing his internal struggle, Yu beats its toned muscular ass, Kanji accepts himself, shadow becomes a soul skeletor, and Kanji is saved. Kanji joins the crew, but again, doesn't remember much about the kidnapping, TV induced amnesia must be a bitch. The group decides that people who show up on the news end up in the midnight channel, and then get kidnapped. Hopefully you already knew this though, because I've been trying to make it painfully obvious this entire video so far. Famous teen idol Rise is coming home to Inaba. It's on the news, so she must be the next victim. Oh shit, she's on the Midnight Channel. Who would have seen that coming? Oh gee, not me. The group decides to stake out her grandma's tofu shop in hopes of stopping the culprit. They run into Adachi and run down some weird ass paparazzi peeping Tom dude. Adachi takes him to the police station and congratulations, you caught the culprit. Not quite. Rise's Midnight Channel is clear now, so her ass got dumped into TV. Go save her. This time, Yu chases the shadow through a strip club, attempting to stop her from exposing everything. Also, Rise is a first year high schooler. Devs got weird with the Kanji and Rise shadows, just saying. Rise struggles with her identity as she desires the world to know who she really is beyond the fake idol that she has to show off to the public. This time, when Rise denies herself, you fight a hippie stripper satellite who, after a while, ends up bodying everyone. You're basically all fucked until Teddy decides to go Super Saiyan, nukes everything, and wins while looking like he just got run over in a Looney Tune special. Just like everyone else, Rise comes to her senses after having her shadow beaten senseless. Hippie stripper satellite becomes elegant wedding satellite. Just when everything seems to be turning around, Teddy starts having an existential crisis about his existence, truth, meaninglessness. Shut up, Demon Teddy. Cash these hands. Turn into fat nuke bear persona thing. After Risei gets saved, Dojima comes home drunk as hell. Dude is tripping because the higher-ups brought in a young hotshot detective to help with the case. Police are making zero progress on the murders and kidnappings because, you know, throwing people into TVs and letting shadows kill them is kind of fucking crazy. Good news though, Rise didn't appear on the Midnight Channel because you saved her. But oh shit, there's another body? How? This time it's Moroka. <gasps> they look for Teddy to see if he knows anything and find out the bear hopped over into the human world. 
That's not suspicious at all, especially since he now has a job as Juness's mascot. What is the hiring process at Japanese companies? Because I know for a fact this motherfucker does not have the ID needed to get a job. But Blanca, what if someone peeks under the costume? He's hollow, remember? I was wondering the exact same thing until he rips his own head off because it's too hot and somehow materializes into the anime Pretty Boy. The group is trying to figure out how the hell Moraoka fits into all of this when the boy that was talking to Kanji earlier rolls up. The boy's name is Naoto, and this is the detective Dojima was tripping about. Naoto says, don't bother about Moraoka. The police are closing in on a suspect. A couple days later, the group overhears Adachi's dumbass talking to himself. Yes, the police have a suspect, but they can't find him. Yu decides to check the Midnight Channel just in case and finds that creepy ass dude who tried to hit on Yukiko. His name is Mitsuo. Mitsuo is all like, try and catch me. Bet. They jump in the TV, head to his weird ass 80s game world where real Mitsuo claims he killed everyone. Of course, Mitsuo doesn't agree with his shadow, so the crew fights off a magic fetus hiding in a pixelated dungeon night. These bosses are just getting weirder. The homies win, baby softly floats to the ground where it gets barbecued, don't ask, I have no idea. The cops take Mutsuo in, he's claiming he killed everyone because he was pissed off and wanted attention. Good job everyone, the killer has been found. But the game's not over. Naoto starts going to use school, gets interviewed on TV, and states having issues with the current state of the case. He believes Moroka's death does not line up with the others. Then the Midnight Channel comes on. Why is Naoto on the Midnight Channel? They caught the killer, right? Wrong. Mitsuo is nothing more than a bitch copycat killer that was starved for attention. He killed Moroka, but no one else. Naoto had this whole game loop figured out already and decided to get himself interviewed and then kidnapped in order to test his theory. After going through a crazy science lab, chasing down a shadow that wants a sex change, beating up a Crash Bandicoot boss, finding out Naoto is actually a girl, <gasps> learning she's tired of being looked down on because she's a child detective and hides being a girl, and giving her a cool ass mosquito persona that's low key OP, the crew saves Naoto and gets its final party member. Clearly, this case is far from over. After saving Naoto, Adachi's drunk ass starts running his mouth again, saying they only have evidence to pin Moroka on Mitsuo, and there's likely another perp. After recovering, Naoto describes being drugged, thrown into a sack, and then the TV in a matter of minutes. The culprit is likely a man who is acting alone. Interesting. Yu gets an unmarked warning letter that simply says, don't rescue anymore. Wait, the killer knows where he lives? Right after, we get a cutscene of a madman watching TV static and talking to himself saying he's going to save everyone. Take them to a place where they can be at peace. Huh? The news has a story about Inaba's elementary school. You hear a familiar voice who gets interviewed. Sometime later, you gets another letter. This one says, if you don't stop, this time someone close to you will be put in and killed. Dojima reads the letter and drags you all the way to the police station. You explains everything, but naturally, Dojima thinks he's full of shit. It's raining and it's midnight. So you looks at the TV. No! Nanako is on the Midnight Channel? You can't do anything but the other seat and Naoto rushes to check on Nanako. Somehow a group of kids manages to rush the police station and barge into an interrogation room without being stopped. Shout out to Japanese police. They inform Dojima that Nanako has been kidnapped and he rushes off. Then the rest of the group rushes in the police station and barges into the interrogation room as well. Security really isn't that good. Huh. They get together and deduce the kidnapper is a delivery man who has a TV in the back of his van. A delivery man that was once a politician caught up in a serious scandal. Don't remember? I'll tell you. Fucking Namatame. Dojima is in hot pursuit of his daughter's kidnapper until Namatame's dumbass tries to drift in the rain. Flips his truck and Dojima runs straight into it. Somehow Namatame ends up missing and Dojima's all kinds of messed up. Naoto finds Namatame's diary, confirming he's been tracking all of the victims. Dojima gets rushed to the hospital and the crew goes in the TV to save Nanako. They get to Nanako's version of heaven and find her being held up by Namatame. Namatame sounds like he's in a trance. The people that end up on the media have to be saved. So he kidnaps them and throws them into the TV in order to save them. This guy is out of his damn mind. Then suddenly he becomes a shadow. A shadow continues the monologue like they all do. The guys rush his ass down and get Nanako, who's already fainted. Namatame goes berserk as he's enveloped in shadows and becomes Kunino Sagiri, aka Weird Gear Head Angel Thing. Kunino gets his ass beat, Namatame faints, and the gang finally catches the killer. Maybe. Nanako and Namatame are rushed to the hospital and everyone has to wait for them to recover. This time, even after saving Nanako, the fog is still in town. Doesn't it usually clear up after saving someone? What? What's going on this time? It's finally okay to visit Nanako, but the doctors can't figure out what's wrong with her. Namatame is still out of his damn mind, and the police can't get much out of him. 
As time passes, the fog gets thicker and thicker. However, the glasses that clear the fog in the shadow world also work in the human world. Something's not right. Is that fog leaking in to the human world? Yu gets a call from Adachi. Something's wrong with Nanako. The scared, innocent little girl who deserved none of this is hanging on by a thread. And then she flatlined. Nanako is dead. Everyone starts losing their shit. The girls are crying. Nojima tries to go after Namatame. Kanji's about to beat Adachi's ass in order to get the room number of Namatame. Luckily, security is able to stop Nojima, giving the crew an opportunity to sneak into Namatame's room. The real Namatame continues to lose his shit, while Shadow Namatame appears on the TV like an asshole, saying that he can basically do whatever he wants and they're not going to stop him. And this is where the game decides to branch off into its many endings. Don't worry, we're going to hit them all. But there will be some time hopping as we go from one ending to the next, so stay with me. Yusuke says throw Namatame back into the TV and let the shadows kill him. Most of his crimes won't hold up in court, so this might be your only chance to finally end this. If you agree with Yosuke, you get bad ending one. Namatame is thrown into the TV world and dies. The murder case remains shrouded in mystery. Nanako remains dead. Teddy goes back to his world. The fog is still around. Yu gets on a train and goes home months later. If you refuse to throw Namatame into the TV and let the cops deal with him, you get bad ending two. Everything from bad ending one is still the same, except Namatame confesses to the kidnappings, but not the actual murders. The case is still unsolved. Thankfully, Nanako comes back from the dead and survives, but remains in the hospital for a very long time. If you choose to continuously say something's not right, eventually the rest of the group starts to understand that there's still more questions that need to be answered and leave Namatame to reassess the case. By choosing not to kill Namatame, Nanako comes back to life, but she's still in pretty bad shape. For now, she remains in the hospital. The next day, the group deduces someone else likely wrote the warning letters. This means that Namatame isn't the real culprit. They sneak into Namatame's room and ask him what the hell is going on. Namatame says after his affair scandal broke out, he was fired and went back to his parents in Inaba. He randomly saw Mayumi on the Midnight Channel, found out he could touch the TV the same way you did, and after Mayumi turned up dead, thought people who appear on the TV die. He then sees Saki on TV, gets a delivery job from his dad, and he tries to warn Saki when he sees her on his route. As we know, she also dies. Now, Matama even tried calling to police, but they just completely blew him off for obvious reasons. I mean, people on TV, it's fucking crazy. Now, Matama then sees Yukiko. This time, he decides to use his power of putting things in the TV to quote unquote save her and keep her away from the killer. Realizing Yukiko didn't die because you saved her, he thinks the plan worked and continues kidnapping people using his job as a cover. He had no idea how dangerous the TV world really was until he went inside himself with Nanako. Namatame really isn't that bad of a dude. He's super remorseful and is ready to face responsibility for his crimes. He's just an ignorant pawn to some greater scheme. With this information, someone else is the true culprit. You get three guesses to figure out who it is. Based on your answers, we get another set of potential endings. If you guess wrong all three times, you get bad ending number three, which is more or less the same outcome as bad ending two, other than the fact that you just know that there's another culprit. If you guess right, you figure out Adachi is the true culprit. Wait, Adachi's dumbass is behind all this? But it does make sense. Think about it. Adachi would have been able to monitor you. He would have been able to deliver the letters without suspicion, had direct contact with the first two murder victims, and he's the one that's been feeding the group information this whole game. Holy shit! Adachi is the killer? If you leveled up your social link with Adachi, you have another choice on top of that. Does you tell his friends? If you doesn't and chooses to protect Adachi, you get the accomplice ending. You visit Adachi before leaving Inaba and confronts him about his crimes. Adachi plays dumb and then hands you the warning letter Dojima took and a lighter. This is the only piece of evidence that could connect the killer to the murders. If you chooses to burn the letter, he commits a felony by destroying evidence. Adachi essentially uses this to blackmail you and now he has to answer Adachi's call whenever he beckons. He calls you his partner, but let's be real, you just became Adachi's bitch. Like the other endings, Nanako survives but stays in the hospital. Teddy goes back to his world. Fog is still around. If you decides to tell his friends about Adachi, they start to put the pieces together and rush back to the hospital to confront him. After backing Adachi into a corner, he books it and goes into the TV. Teddy pops up just in time to tell everyone he figured out he's a shadow, but no one cares. He's annoying, but he's cool because he has his own persona and all the other deep meaning story stuff about friendship that's too complicated for this video. He goes Super Saiyan in the TV world and manages to ping Adachi. Adachi now totally deranged admits to throwing the first two victims in the TV because he basically tried to make a move on him and got denied. Let's not forget Saki's a high schooler. Adachi's a grown ass man. 
it's weird. Apparently, Adachi was the one that answered Namatame's call. He not only blew Namatame off, but also dropped hints that spurred Namatame into playing the hero and doing all the kidnappings that he did. Why did Adachi do all this? Because it was fun. Because he's a sick fuck who was bored. Found out that he has this power and started orchestrating murders for the fun of it. He even threw Mitsu in on TV so the police wouldn't catch him and end Adachi's game. Like any good villain, Adachi monologues way too long and decides to include his master plan. By the end of the year, the fog will merge the two worlds together and everyone will be consumed by shadows. By the way, it's currently December. The crew decides to regroup and take him on when they're more prepared. They find Adachi who preaches bullshit about the world being a better place if everyone's a shadow. He himself turns into a shadow, but gets his ass beat anyway. Just when you think it's finally over, he gets full on exorcism level possessed, and the puppeteer says he'll unite the world after turning everyone into shadows. This will be the peace mankind desires. Adachi's been possessed by Amino Sagiri, the one who rules the fog, and shepherds humans to their true desires. This is where it gets deep. Try to keep up. Humans view things as they want. They do not desire the truth. Instead, they hide undesirable truths in a metaphorical fog. The TV world is nothing more than the unconscious desires that exist in human hearts, and as humanity continues to abandon truth, the fog will grow thicker until it consumes the real world. Amino also claims to have created the Midnight Channel based on human desire. It's a window through which one only sees what they want as they crave more false images. At this point, he's just describing social media, but then again, our world is also fucked, so... Yosuke has a point when he says that they fought for the truth, and Amino decides to test that resolve. He morphs into the eyes that every PC gamer dreams of having, and tries to fight the homies. All they really needed was a handful of sand, but after an extended battle, they defeat RGBI. Amino is impressed by the human potential, decides to lift the fog, but warns he'll be back if humans start fucking around again. Adachi's taken to jail, Namatama's case is being evaluated, the fog has finally lifted. Congrats, you win, but the game refuses to end. Nanako and Dojima come home from the hospital and you celebrate New Year's. Based on whether or not you max your social link with Marie, the game again splits between different pasts. If you didn't max her link, you fast forward to the day before you leave, say bye to everyone, and decide to go home and prepare to leave. This gets you the normal ending. Fog's gone. Everyone's healthy. They're all there to send you off as he gets on his train. If you do the exact same series of events, but don't go home to prepare when it asks you, the game refuses to end, and you're on your way to what they call the true ending. If you max out Marie's link, you're on your way to the golden ending, which is basically the exact same thing as the true ending, but has extra content. So we're gonna focus on this one. I promise, this is the last ending. No more time hopping for those of you that have been struggling to keep up. So rewind, back to New Year's. You goes to the Velvet Room to find out Marie is missing. Margaret says she served her purpose, but you're all like, screw that, find her. You and his friends eventually go on a ski trip, get lost in a blizzard, and oh look, the random cabin in the woods has a random TV right there. Oh look, the TV moves when you touch it. Oh shit, an arm just pulled everyone into the TV. Margaret pulled everyone into what they call the hollow forest, a closed realm created by Marie to shut herself away. Throughout Marie's social link, she was struggling to regain her memory. Margaret informs you she was originally a resident of the TV world, regained her lost memory, didn't like what it was, and decided to hold herself up in this big ass dome. If Marie isn't saved, the realm will close and everyone's memory of Marie will disappear forever. Of course, they don't want that, they decide to go after her. They catch up to Marie who explains she is Kusumi no Okami, one of the greater powers like the two Sagiri. Remember, Gearhead Angel Guy and RGB Eyeball. After Amino's defeat, fog didn't actually go away. She absorbed it. In order to truly get rid of the fog, Marie has to sacrifice herself, something the group clearly does not approve of. To save the group, Marie says if they won't leave, she'll make them. So the two sides, who are actually trying to save each other, end up beating the shit out of each other instead. Makes sense. Marie loses and the fog inside her starts corrupting her body. Everyone finally agrees to let Marie put her mind to sleep, let the fog come out, kick its ass, and hopefully that will save Marie while getting rid of the fog once and for all. After smacking the female spawn around, she explodes and Marie is left lying there, dead. Nah, she's fine. Right after Teddy rubs his face all over her tits. They dip, Marie is safe, and now she's free to live among humanity. Remember when I talked about the normal ending and your choice to go home and prepare? Well, if you don't prepare and head back to Juness, all the friends magically appear and you start reminiscing about the case. No one knows how the Midnight Channel started or how you, Namatame, and Adachi got their powers. Many questions still need answers. 
Yu goes around the town looking for clues, and eventually Igor gives him what's called the Orb of Sight, the power to dispel lies and show the truth. Maria also explains that she was the original wish of humanity to protect the world and fulfill the wishes of man. When people stopped wishing for truth and pursued other desires, like Amino explained, Marie split into two parts. The her that wanted to protect humanity and the more powerful her that wanted to fulfill humanity's boundless desires by using the fog. The Marie we know is a fragment of the whole, explaining why she has no memory or power. She didn't have enough power to clear the fog without having to sacrifice herself. Because of this, she became a tool used by the other self. Confusing as hell, I know. Hope you're still with me. The other Marie is the one that gave you the power and created the Midnight Channel. She's the one behind everything. After a bit more investigating, you figures out, oh my god, the gas station attendant is the mastermind? Holy shit! When we shook hands and felt unwell, that was because she awakened his power. She did the same thing for Adachi and Namatame to push this master plan forward. What? Gas station attendant reveals herself as Izanami. The two Sagiri and Marie, all born from her. The Midnight Channel, her creation. This whole fucking fiasco we've been dealing with for the last 70 hours? This bitch. She retreats off to the shadow world with you and friends in close pursuit. Finally, this is it. Because every villain gets a monologue before getting their ass kicked, Izanami takes full advantage and actually discusses some really deep stuff. Similar to Amino, man desires a world shrouded in fog to hide the truth. And like Marie explained, Izanami is part of her that was created to fill man's wish. So if you really think about it, humanity is just out here trying to kill itself like it usually does. Izanami is just a tool that's going to make it happen. The group politely disagrees and decides to destroy her. Izanami doesn't appreciate that, so she grows 100 feet tall and straight disrespects the crew's strength by blindfolding herself and putting on a straitjacket. Bad idea because she ends up getting her ass beat. Then Yu uses the Orb of Sight to reveal the truth, reveals Izanami's true form, your mom. Your mom starts dragging everyone to the Shadow Realm, and at this point, you are totally fucked. It's over, you lose. Until the power of friendship and the bonds you forge throughout the game gives you the strength to come back and one shot of God. Finally, it is over. Marie tells you all the fragments they defeated, the Sagiri and Izanami, will return to her and she will finally become whole. She will finally be back to her true self, Izanami no Mikoto. Igor and Margaret give you his well-deserved GGs. The fog has also lifted from the shadow world and everyone is at the train station the next day to see you off. Persona 4 Arena Ultimax happens a couple months later. Don't worry, we'll cover that in the next video. But then the following summer, Yu is back in Inaba. Namatame was released due to lack of evidence, has seen the light, and is actually running for mayor of Inaba now. Everyone updated their look. Adachi is being a good boy in jail. Marie became a weather girl, and she confesses her love for Yu on public television, which makes Risei insanely jealous. Yeah, this high school protagonist got a god and an idol to fall in love with him. That's the most anime shit ever, just like pretty much everything else we just talked about. And that's Persona 4. Again, one of my favorite RPGs of all time. There's so much outside the main storyline that we didn't even touch, and I highly suggest you try it for yourself. When the credits started rolling after the golden ending, I just sat there. I could not have been happier of the experience I just had, but I was also just as depressed because it was over. I mean, emotional damage the mark of a truly great game. If you found this video helpful or at all entertaining, please be sure to like, subscribe, and enable notifications so you don't miss any amazing future content. Also, make sure you let me know in the comments what other games do you want to see. We've already done a ton of other explain videos, so make sure you check those out as well if you are interested. As we continue the explain series, please bear with me as these videos take time. Many of these games need to be replayed in order to get the full experience, and Blanc is a very busy boy with a full-time job, young family, and a growing live stream. If you want to hang out with us on the live stream, join the family on Discord or connect on any of the socials. All my links can be found in the description below. I'm La Muerte Blanca and I'll catch you guys next time.